I'd like to continue on then uh, to um, the fine folks at uh, CodeShip, uh, Brendan and Kyle, um, and they're going to talk about um, a tale of two containers. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. <coughs> I think my allergies are killing me, so pardon me if I uh, cough my head off up here. So um, I just want to uh, thank you guys for inviting us out here. Um, we're super excited uh, to be here. Uh, anytime uh, Brennan gets a chance to talk Docker, he, he jumps at it. So um, anyway, uh, so just a little bit about us. Uh, my name is uh, Kyle Rames. Um, I, I am actually a senior uh, developer at CodeShip. Um, and I kind of predominantly work on uh, the front end although whenever I get a chance, I kind of jump into the uh, the internals of the CI engine. And uh, Brendan, uh, who's gonna be up here in just a little bit, um, <clears throat> he's actually been uh, focused on our next generation uh, product and he's gonna talk a little bit about that. So just out of curiosity, uh, how many of you have heard of CodeShip? All right, awesome. A good show of hands. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't, uh, we're a continuous integration, a continuous deployment product. Um, if you don't love your CI server, um, you should really check us out. Um, we got some really good uh, free trials. Um, and that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, so for today, uh, this is our agenda. We're gonna talk uh, briefly a little bit about uh, the history of the CodeShip platform. Um, and then we're gonna kinda delve into uh, the tale of our two containers. Uh, the first one is uh, CheckBot, and that's actually powered by LXC. And then the second one, uh, which Brendan is gonna tell you about, is uh, Jet, and that's actually powered by Docker. And then we wanna, want to uh, leave you with kind of our, our final thoughts on uh, what we see uh, CI, CD evolving to. <clears throat> So uh, basically, CodeShip was uh, started in 2011. Um, it's kind of roughly around the time Ubuntu 12.04 uh, Precise Penguin came out. Um, and that's the one that actually shipped with uh, support for uh, containers in the kernel, as well as LXC. And uh, one of our founders uh, took a look at it and said, hey, this would be a great uh, uh, framework to build a CI server on it and uh, CheckBot uh, was born. So, and uh, CheckBot currently does about 39,000 builds uh, per day um, and about uh, 8,000, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, 8 million uh, per year. So it's kind of our, our workhorse. Um, and then over time, we kind of uh, have noticed as uh, CheckBot had organically grown uh, that, that uh, we were having some problems kind of evolving our platform and providing the CI experience that we wanted to. Um, and so uh, kind of around uh, 2014, uh, another, our, the same founder uh, went to uh, DockerCon and uh, he was uh, taking a look at Docker and said, hey, this might be a great platform to build a CI server. And so uh, Jet was born. Um, uh, and development of Jet uh, started uh, like 2014, uh, kind of uh, our first beta was uh, I think April 2015. Um, and then uh, we actually just officially launched the product back in February. And it was pretty exciting. I had just, just started and uh, I was trying to, um, uh, see how all my coworkers were doing on that day and nobody was responding to me and uh, probably a couple hours later like, oh, we just launched our major product. So that was, uh, that was exciting. Um, so uh, Jet, uh, the volume is a little bit lower. Um, we do about uh, 1,500 uh, builds uh, per day um, and uh, we have about 115,000 uh, builds kind of in the lifetime of this product. So it is moderately battle tested. So uh, now I want to kind of delve into uh, a little bit more detail about uh, CheckBot. As I said, it's actually uh, powered by LXC. Um, and kind of uh, the, the reason that our uh, founders actually got excited about it um, uh, was that uh, the, the first thing it does for us is it kind of helps impose uh, resource limits. Uh, so we're, we're not gonna get uh, uh, people that are running away with CPU or memory or disk space. Um, 
Containers are also isolated, uh, so when I'm running a build, I don't have to worry about you know seeing your build or, or vice versa. Um, and then one of the other nice benefits of that um, is that it actually provides uh, separation between the the code ship infrastructure uh, and, and the actual builds that are going on. Um, it actually allows for us to have kind of a secure uh, uh, environment so nobody can kind of bust into a container uh, and, and steal other people's code, uh, which is very important to us because uh, the day somebody uh, takes some source code is probably the day we're going out of business. Um, it also uh, provides a kind of a consistent uh, environment and build experience. So if I uh, run my build today um, and my tests are good and uh, dependable, then I should be able to run those tomorrow and, and get the same results. <clears throat> And then the last thing is that it's automatable, which if you're going to uh, write a uh, SaaS solution on something, uh, automatable is, is pretty good. <laughs> Um, so basically the way we use LXC is we, we create this universal image. And in this universal image, we have some pre-installed languages. We have Ruby, Python, Go, Java. I think there's a couple others. Um, we also have some, some predefined services that run. Uh, so we have several versions of MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Cassandra, uh, Mongo, you know, all the greats. Um, as well as some some standard C libraries uh, like uh, <clears throat> Image Magic, um, what have you. Um, and so with with this image, uh, basically what happens is users go in, uh, they set up their project, and the first uh, screen they see is actually to kind of conf uh, to configure their tests. So this is where you you would go ahead and uh, specify, like you can see to set up your tests. So you can see we're specifying uh, the version of Ruby we're using. We're installing our libraries. We're setting up some environment variables, uh, doing doing some database uh, migrations. And then the next screen is actually where uh, you you would uh, set up your tests. So you can see here that we're um, uh, running some unit tests, and then after those are finished, some some feature tests, and then uh, finally some some uh, uh, JavaScript tests. Um, and we actually have a capability of like running multiple pipelines, um, so you can actually have you know unit tests run in one. You can have some linters run in another. And this is basically under the covers uh, what it looks like. Uh, so you can see I had mentioned the pipeline. So you can see the, the different pipelines that we have. Um, we, we use that LXC universal container uh, for each one of those pipelines. And then we execute uh, those, those user commands. So like set it, running the um, unit tests, the, the feature tests, what have you. And if all these pipelines successfully complete, um, then uh, it actually, you, you have the option of firing off a deployment uh, provider and it will then deploy uh, that code. <coughs> Um, so under the covers, basically the way uh, that we do it is we, we have uh, a server called Fleet, uh, which shouldn't be uh, confused with uh, Fleet Control and CoreOS. Uh, Fleet uh, basically kind of main, uh, maintains a, uh, a list of all the build machines, you know, which, which build machines have like vacant uh, pipelines uh, or spots, containers that we can run on, um, and it reports back the, the status of, of logs. Um, and so with the system, uh, I, I mentioned that we were kind of seeing, uh, some, uh, some, some strain. Uh, we're having some, some kind of issues. Uh, so in particular for our developers, um, you can see that we actually have shared, uh, requirements for every user. So, um, if you're, you're not using one of our predefined languages or services or libraries, if you, if you have something that's very specific to your project or your industry, um, Unfortunately, the checkbot architecture won't work for you. Um, <clears throat> and then there's also uh, kind of a problem maintaining uh, parity uh, between your development environment and uh, and your CI server and production. So uh, with checkbot, you run into those those problems where, well, it works on my machine. Uh, why doesn't it work on, on on CI, which can be frustrating. And then issues for us um, that we're having with this architecture um, 
uh, that, that's kind of preventing us from providing the, the type of experience we'd like um, is that uh, you could see that the the um, all the parallel services that we're running inside of each pipeline um, leaves a huge memory footprint. So if you're just basically running linters, um, uh, then you know we're still firing up. MySQL and Postgres and, and Mongo and all, all these things that, that you don't need. So um, it, it's a little bit more uh, expensive for us to run. Um, and then there's also like a lack of tooling around LXC. It, it would be really nice if there was uh, like say a, a universal kind of format uh, that, that people could just give us uh, our, our containers to run. But I will say that it works. And uh, if you fall into our niche, uh, it, it works extremely well for you. It's, 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 very, it's very easy uh, uh, for, for users to get started. Um, but that brings us to the, the tail of our next container. And uh, Brennan's going to tell us a little bit about Jet. There you go, Brennan. Thanks. Sweet. Uh, so, um, so obviously, as Kyle explained, uh, Checkbot and our LXC infrastructure work pretty well, um, and there are some uh, some problems with that. So we looked to Docker to solve some of these issues, and by using Docker on top of a lot of the benefits you get from LXC, you also benefit from a pretty core standardization of the tooling around it. So with Docker, obviously, there's a standardized build process. There's a standardized image sharing process. How you run containers is standardized. There's great tooling around this as well. It's easy to automate. There are APIs. Uh, it's highly supported in various um, hosting providers. So it's a really good and extremely portable tool. Because it's portable and users can download it and execute it locally, we can maintain excellent parity between development, test, and production. So people can run the same Docker containers locally, push those up to their CI server, execute tests, push those up to production. Um, everything is easy to use um, within, between all those environments. Also, because users are building their own containers, you get the benefit that people can basically use their own base OS, the exact version they want to use. They can install their own uh, libraries, they can install their own applications, and they can install only those. So the, the, net guilt, the, the net result here is that we empower our users to have much better uh, control over their CI platform and their, uh, their build process. So the way we use Docker is relatively simple. We just provision a Docker resource, like a Docker endpoint of some kind, uh, everything we need to execute the build is present within the repository we check out from the user via webhook. So we don't need that, that um, configure your test screen that Kyle showed you earlier. We don't have that for our Jet platform. It's all inside the repository. It's all included. And then on top of that, we layer some very specific features for our platform to make things a little bit more secure, a little bit easier to use, a little bit more powerful that don't make sense in the general Docker context. So we kind of use a co-chip flavor of a lot of Docker features. And of course, we're, uh, this is a heavily Docker-centric product. So we, we, uh, we, we try and integrate with as many uh, Docker-specific endpoints as we can and services and features. So the way a user runs a Docker build with CodeChip is uh, relatively easy. You, um, we use a compose-like syntax to describe uh, services that a user might write. Now, a service, of course, being a, uh, a specific image being run in a specific way. Uh, so if anyone's familiar with Docker Compose, it's going to look very familiar to that. Um, and users can write custom images where they need to. They can write Docker files, build things on the fly, or they can use standard images available in registries, that kind of thing. And this is all committed to the source code repository. So changes you make to your CI process are paired with the code changes needed to support those, uh, those alterations. And this is what a simple services file looks like. It's a, it should look very familiar to a compose syntax. We're defining a test service, building from the local context, with a specific Docker file, and it links to a database service. Then we've also got a, com a compile service down below. We've got maybe our production application, and then we've got a deployment container uh, executing that and, and making a change in our production cluster for us. Along with the services, we also need to define how we execute changes through our pipeline. And we do this through what we call a steps file. And this is, this is essentially a list of 
commands being executed against a specific service inside your services file. Now these can be pretty much anything. We don't um, we don't separate testing from deployment like we do with our other application, uh, other platform. It can be you can be running tests in here. You can be compiling code, running deployment, running a notification. You can be even reaching out to something like a some kind of semaphore server, waiting for your QA QE team to log on and check that your staging environment is valid, or do some UI testing or something like that. Um, it can be pretty much anything you want it to be, and you get control over the flow and how much of your, your uh, pipeline is running parallel with the rest of it. And again, this is committed to your source code repository, so it's entirely self-contained and changes have parity uh, between your configuration and your code itself. And this is what we use uh, for our steps file. Um, this is a simple YAML format where we define a, a set of steps. The default type is just a simple run step, so the second example there, service command, is is a simple combination of a specific service from your services file and a command. You can also run things in parallel in kind of a short form by inheriting the service at the top level of a grouping. So we essentially have a parallel set of steps with two examples we're running. And, uh, and later on we have a push step down there too, which is pushing a Docker image that we've built as a, part of our service out through a remote repository using a configuration we've encrypted as part of the uh, code chip flavor of uh, the Docker features. And finally, we're running a deployment uh, at the end of our CI process. And we'll, we'll look more at this later. But this translates into a set of containers that run on your, um, on your, uh, build, build, your uh, build server, where we have two, uh, two sets of containers running in parallel and in isolation, each with their own uh, database instance running, each running a different command. When both of those succeed, we compile and we deploy and push. These are actually in the wrong order, but ignore that. That's fine. I'll fix it next time for sure. I told myself I'd fix it not last time, and I didn't. So, um, but this all runs as part of a standard process. It, it's all in sequence, and you control flow and you control parallelization, all that good stuff. So, um, an important aspect here is maintaining parity because. We, uh, we already talked about that a little bit, and parity is important. We want our users to have as similar an experience locally as they do on the CI server. Like Kyle said, you know, if your, if your tests are good, then when you execute something locally, or when you execute something on CI and you run it again a few days later, it should have the exact same effect. So we do this, this is where kind of the code chip flavor comes in a little bit. Uh, we support in credential encryption, which normally credentials are available locally, but when you're running on a CI server, you want to make sure those are encrypted in a data bag. But the process for injecting those may be different locally than it is in CI and in production. We also support the uh, image layers from a Docker, uh, Docker image build to be shared between a completely isolated build, uh, build servers on the CI service. So when you run a build, you run two builds in sequence, they're actually sharing the image layers. So things like a, a bundle install or an NPM install uh, don't take as much time as they would normally. And this is something you can experience locally when you rebuild a Docker image. If changes haven't been made, if files that are being added to your Docker build context haven't changed, your build is a lot faster because you're using that cache. And we try to make that experience uh, as flawless, as seamless as possible remotely as well as locally. It's completely isolated to a user. In fact, the user provides a registry endpoint to push the cache to, so you control your image. Uh, and we also provide some uh, standard tooling around this to make it a little bit easier. So you, we have a runner, which I'll show you later, which is also called Jet, just to be confusing. Um, and you can use this to run your, uh, your tests, your entire CI process uh, locally in the same way it would run on CI. And because we're using containers, and because we, because we have that great parity between development and test and production, uh, you can expect that process to act exactly the same way. And because we're using a standard compose syntax, we try to extend the functionality of compose a little bit. So you can also do things like a compose up style execution of a build server with, your, uh, with, your, uh, with our tooling, um, with your services file. So we're using Docker. Docker is great. I love saying the word Docker. But it does have some issues. 
uh, using Docker itself gives us a much higher barrier to entry. With our checkpoint infrastructure, users weren't aware that we were using LXC. They didn't have to know anything about LXC. They just had to put in a simple script uh, that would work on in Bash or something, and it would just work, provided we had those services, um, those libraries installed. But for users to use our Docker platform, they have to understand how Docker works. They have to understand the intricacies of add versus copy in a Docker file, or how to, uh, how to use volumes to share artifacts between containers, how the isolation between steps and containers works. So it's not as simple as pasting in your, um, pasting in your uh, you see a process into a, a steps file. It's a lot more complicated. In fact, I saw a nice five hour build today from somebody, which was essentially that. Um, it does require a lot of careful understanding and configuration centered around Docker. And the tooling does help, the, the Docker tooling and the Docker resources do help, but it's not something that you can just jump into. And um, generally we have customers come to us who know Docker and want to use our service because they like Docker and they want to integrate Docker fully into their pipeline. But it's not always the case. We have had a lot of people come to us also who want to learn about Docker and start using us as a way to learn Docker or um, despite not knowing anything about Docker. And the separate containers being isolated is, is fantastic, uh, but it also means it's, there's less visibility between services running in different containers. So it's a lot harder to do debug as a result. Um, with our older infrastructure, we can start a debug session where you can SSH in to a build machine which has your code checked out, and you can just play around, you can check ports, you can uh, log into PSQL or something and just go nuts, but it's a lot harder to do that when you have isolated containers. And for us, there's this whole set of issues as well. We're heavily tied to Docker. Our entire product is dependent upon Docker. If they make a change, if they add a feature, we get that feature, which is great. If they break something, which they have, <laughs> then it breaks for us as well and it breaks for our customers. So that's not great. Um, so um, there, there are some problems, but you know, it's, um, it, it is what it is and it is better we feel it's more towards where you want to go as a product. So let's, uh, let's do a really quick demo, um, which is probably going to work really well. And that clear command obviously worked perfectly, didn't it? <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, our, our, this is a, one of our, um, our test applications. We use this as kind of a smoke test for our CI service. Can you guys see that okay? Great. All right. So, actually, I can make this a little better. There we go. So, this is a really simple application we've built. It does a lot. There is actually no code here. Um, and in this file, in this folder, we have a services file and we have a steps file. And these are what we these are what we talked about uh, earlier. And this, uh, this services file is really simple. We're using, uh, we're, we're, has anyone noticed anything different about this from the comp compose syntax by any chance? Uh, the, the build section is, uh, is not supported by uh, compose, or maybe it is now with, the, uh, with v2, but uh, we treat things a little bit differently. We allow you to define an image as well as a Docker file to build your image from because we do, we do both pushing and pulling and building for the same image sometimes because we allow you to cache those images or cache them. What, is, what, is, what does what mean? What does the build mean or what is the? No, what, is, what does it mean to have an image and file? So normally for Compose, you e are either pulling down an image to use or you're building one. Right. What, what, what having both means is that perhaps you're pulling down the, build, the image layers for, uh, for something you're going to build on top of those layers. And then when you push it up, we're providing the image to which you want to push that, or the, re the registry to which you want to push that image. So it, it basically is a combination of pushing, pulling, and building a, a single image as part of your CI process. So 
on that, just you know, maybe you can repeat the question one more time. But, sure. Um, obviously, you integrate with the, with multiple um, registries, different Docker registries from different providers. Do you guys have a registry as well? We don't support a registry right now. Um, I don't think we intend on supporting an internal registry. We we try to let users pick their own and provide credentials to their own registries and self-host. We might support mirrors, public mirrors, just to make sure that they're co-located with our build servers. Uh, but we don't support, uh, we don't provide a registry right now. So um, our services file is really simple because our application, as you can tell, is really simple. And our pipeline is also pretty simple. We're doing a printm from inside the container, and then we're doing a push. Can you show the Docker file? The Docker file, certainly. My, this is a real test to my one-handed typing. <laughs> Docker has the best typos, I swear to God. So our, our Docker file is really simple. From Ubuntu, touch a file that's never gonna get used. That's it. So our tool is called Jet, and you can, down, you can download it uh, from our website, and there's a lot of doc documentation around it. It doesn't hinge on our service. You can use all its features independent of hosting your builds on CodeChip. Um, and the, the main command we're gonna use is to execute our, um, CI pipeline. So we're going to run jet steps, and that loads. Whoa, that was fast. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be so surprised. It was that fast. Um, that loads our steps file, and that executes. Uh, that executes uh, the services with the commands we've specified. And of course, we're just doing a printm, so it doesn't really tell us very much. And by default, we prevent you from stabbing yourself in the foot. Uh, so we we disable pushing images by default, but we can do a simple dash dash push and we start pushing to docker hub or to uh, key.io and that's that's the basis of that's how we maintain parity so normally we'd have a build server on amazon checking out your code and executing the uh executing the uh, steps file and, ex and doing all this stuff for you um, but you can do the exact same thing it's the exact same code with a different wrapper basically to make it a locally executable binary and we can make some really simple um, we can make some really simple changes to this uh, to our service or to our steps file even to make things a little bit more interesting. We can do that. Um, we can do a parallel. That's not how you spell parallel at all, is it? Oh, that's a good idea. Now we've got to bend over it sideways, which is much better. <laughs> Thank you. I can, I can, I can tippy toes now. Okay, sweet. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do a really simple change. We're just going to set up some parallel steps, just like you saw in the example earlier. Get rid of this horrible new line. And so we're going to we're going to take that service and we're going to execute two steps on that in a, in, a, in parallel. And what that does, assuming this works and I, I didn't break anything, is it runs those two containers in isolation alongside of each other, uh, just like you would, just like if you were running a Docker run forked, but it's a lot simpler because you've configured all of your application specifics in your services file. The compose syntax is extremely powerful, and you can define ports that are mapped, you can define volumes, you can define everything, and we, we use that to uh, allow you to create an extremely flexible and powerful CI pipeline. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about, about Jet, um, feel free to hit us up after and I'll, we can give us some more information. But let's get back to the, the slides. So um, where do we see CI going from here? You know, we've, we've kind of traveled with it from single containers and isolated with universal images into kind of this, this new uh, Docker scenario. And 
We've seen a lot of other CI services using Docker, but we haven't seen anyone using this, this level of Docker, if you will. The configurability of using the compose syntax and letting you specify which containers to use for different parts of your CI service uh, in a standardized way like this. So containers gives us a huge amount of isolation, portability, resource control, all those wonderful things. And following on from that, coming from LXC to Docker, you know, Docker is super powerful. It's the big thing. Everyone's talking about it. I say the word Docker at least 20 times a day. And if I don't, I get very depressed. Um, and it, it gives you all this control in, over, your, over how your automation works and over how you configure your CI services and how you configure your, your, uh, your execution environments and your dependencies and everything. And you can do this, you can run things locally as you would in CI as we saw. Uh, Docker is a great tool for that because everyone can access it, everyone can download it easily and there's great tooling around it. And it caters to everybody. Uh, you don't, you, if you can run your application in any container, then you can use Docker and you can use Docker for CI. So our, our CI CD process, which is essentially configuration of a workload, execution of it and then notification on that has gone from what you saw earlier, which is a set of pipelines and in individual containers and you know, standardized notification or um, standardized notification configuration in the UI plus deployment configuration in the UI, all project configuration, very UI heavy, into a set of containers and that's it. Tests, deployment, compilation, notification, Everything is in containers, and if you can find a container that does what you want, or if you can write one, then we can support it. And it's as simple as that. So where do we see CI kind of going from here? Um, the, the goals that we have for CI are, we want it to be completely native. We want your CI service to be native to your application and to your environment. No matter what OS that is, no matter what library that is you're using, that awful open source library. Um, we want it to be personal to your needs. It should work for you. You shouldn't have to conform to it. We want it to be instantly available. It's, we're living in a time of the internet, internet of things and, and uh, extreme scale, so we want, to, we want your CI service to respond to that. And we want it to be almost more intelligent and know more about your tests than you do. And we can do a lot of really cool things with containers around this because your uh, the components of your pipeline are so isolated, we can monitor those, we can grab very specific metrics about that. We can tell you, if you move this parallel step into this group over here, then your entire pipeline will execute, will complete execution three seconds earlier every time. Because your group of st parallel steps are as fast as the slowest group. Uh, we can tell you, hey, this build that just ran spiked load at a much earlier place than before. You may have a performance regression or there may be a bug that got introduced with this commit over here. So that's kind of, that's the vision that drives us and that's where we want to take CI from here. And that's, that's about it. Um, you guys have any questions? Um, we have some stickers and we have two very small shirts and one not so small shirt. So if anyone wants to try on the small shirt, I might give you some money just to see that. But uh, <laughs> if you, we'll give away like three shirts. We have one extra large and two tiny. But if you somehow don't fit the small shirt, then just let us know and we'll, get, we'll send a shirt out to you instead. So uh, questions? Right. Um, that's a good question. The question was, how do you isolate builds between users? And how do you protect against things like DDoS? Um, currently, we build everything in a dedicated on-demand instance. So by nature, the entire build for that specific commit is isolated 
Um, and we, kind of, we can rely on the Amazon data centers to take care of some of the rest. But in the future, should we move to a multi-tenanted situation, there are challenges around that. And one of those can be solved by using the Docker network isolation. So the new Docker network plugins can help with that a lot. Um, there's also some user, um, user space for Docker. And there's um, the uh, new, uh, what's the user uh, restriction plugins, user authentication plugins you can add for the new versions of Docker. That kind of stuff is going to help us quite a bit too. Do you want a t-shirt? You're good. Okay. Currently, anything that can fit in a Linux-based Docker file will work. Yes, I believe we are. Um, but that's, that's kind of, we're, we're trying to optimize our currently supported platforms first, but I, I see no reason for us not to support whatever Docker does. So if I have a, a, a CI test and I have 200 tests, right? So with a single compose file, can I, does that run in a single node or does it get parallelized across nodes? It entirely depends, or the question was how, um, how a large set of tests would get distributed across containers? Across hosts. Across hosts. Yeah. Currently, uh, when you sign up for the service, you configure or you select a instance size. And that affects how much memory CPU resources available for builds for your project. Um, and the way that gets split up is entirely dependent upon your steps file, how you configure your pipeline. Because you can run, you can run uh, one container with everything and it may be able to, it'll take a while and you can use the parallels jam in Rails or similar things for, for Node to parallelize your tests. And you can hammer the crap out of your resources to try and get that thing through as quickly as possible. Or you can, um, you can split your tests up into parallel groups and rely on the container isolation and resource controls in the compose syntax, such as CPU limit, mem limit, that kind of thing, to optimize when those uh, execution groups complete. So that's, that's a really good question, and that's something that we kind of deal with a lot, like how to optimize large sets of tests. And um, we're, becoming, we're slowly becoming experts in like some minute optimizations to the compose syntax, and now our containers execute. <laughs> We measure basic statistics for, um, for the build machine, but we intend to measure container level metrics, such as you know, the CPU load of a specific container. Um, so that, that the goal is to have incredibly granular uh, metrics on that and be able to display that to the user and let the user make informed decisions about the composition of their containers and what images are shared and what services are required for different aspects of their build. Oh, I'm sorry, the question was about um, how we track uh, build metrics, if anyone didn't really get that. So your CI uh, server lives in AWS, is that correct? That's correct. Can, can it be configured to use other resources to inject the that, That's a really good question. So the question was, um, if we're on AWS right now, which we are, and if we can configure the uh, build servers to use other resources or other uh, host providers. So basically, all we need to run a build is a Docker resource. Um, the demo we did used the local uh, Docker environment variables to connect to the, uh, is it, where is your, is it on Virtual Ute Docker? Virtual, VirtualBox, okay. There's a Docker host running on VirtualBox. Jet just uses uh, the Docker APIs. That's it, so all we need is a Docker host. So we can support, in theory, right now we're tied to AWS, but in theory we can support any Docker provider. And you know, we're, we're, we're talking about strategy around this, like how, um, how we'd want to support that. You know, but in theory we could support, uh, we could support 
our in, or something on our account at say Rackspace on Karina, we could support a user's um, on-site Docker cluster. Uh, we could support anything that uses standard Docker APIs. Uh, so the question was, how does our CI service compare to a standard service like Jenkins in terms or Bamboo in terms of setting up the project and triggering builds? Yeah, it's more like Travis, right? We have a Travis and a Flow. Right. Get that mm -hmm. So um, it's uh, the the old system is very similar to a standard Jenkins or Bamboo build, and we are closer to Travis, like you said, but. We try to minimize the amount of configuration a user has to do in the interface and maximize the amount of configuration that is tied directly to the source code. So um, well, once... The other thing different is that the command line that you're providing is, I think, identical. To exactly, yeah. The, he said the command line is identical to the build runner, essentially. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. So we've minimized as much as we can the differences between the environments and part of that is configuration. Uh, and we, we tie into source code management the same way other services do via webhooks. So you sign up and you put in your, the repository you want to build and we attach our own webhooks to it and we trigger builds using those the same way. Okay. And then you have the ability to be private instead of public. You can do private repos for Yes, yeah, we, we can support private repos the same way. Yeah. Yeah, um, we could show the interface, but we're unsure of how the Wi-Fi would do. But if you go to codechip.com, just sign up and set up a free repository. We do we support free builds um, for open source repositories for our old platform, and it's it looks pretty much the same for Jet. Um, we have a slightly different UI, but we separate logs for service builds, so for your image builds, and for steps in your pipeline. So you can click on each of those and look at logs and timestamps for the various services. So if you have a database attached for your test, for example, you go into your test step and it shows you logs for each of those two, um, each of those two uh, containers. So you can see if your database starts erroring, you can, start, you can see the errors come in as well alongside your uh, tests themselves. It's been patient. Oh. Uh, what about third party integrations? Like for example, I'm using Shippable a lot and they So the question was asking about third-party integrations for the service. That's a that's a really good question. Um, for GitHub and for uh, Bitbucket, we we call back to the source code management service. So if you open a pull request, you'll see just like you would with any other CI service, you'll see sort of a yellow build running, and you can click a link and go to our service and look at the build running. And when it passes, you'll see it turn green. Um, and you can integrate that with your uh, your bots, uh, preventing people from merging, uh, failing builds, that kind of thing. Um, and, but in terms of, the interesting part of that question is, in terms of integrations externally, you know, we have an API, so you can trigger a build, um, but in terms of what we integrate with on the back end, you know, you saw that list of different development providers. For our Docker platform, we don't support anything. We have a few standard images, but it's up to you to add those to your pipeline. So if you want to integrate with ECR, if you want to push to ECR, and then you want to deploy your uh, ECS cluster, you do that with a custom container that has you know, maybe the AWS client in it, um, and you tell it what cluster to deploy. It's entirely inside your steps pipeline. So it's just like, you know, it's like Barbie, anything's possible, right? That's a really good question. Yeah, yeah um, so the question was if we provide examples um, f to kind of help people get started. Yeah, um, that's a big challenge for us because like we talked about earlier, Docker has a very high bar to entry and 
understanding that very specific context around Docker is a big, uh, it's a big time sink for our support team and it's a big time sink for our new users. Um, so we have some examples of kind of how to use how to use Docker and Jet with Docker specifically to do different things like sharing build artifacts between um, containers and and um, you know encrypting your credentials that kind of thing. We don't have as many um, sort of more complicated examples like you're talking about blue green deployments. I don't think we have any examples of that with Jet specifically, but we try to document as many aspects of how to integrate with custom providers on, on our website um, and provide examples where we can. We also have a community forum that we're, um, we're sort of setting up right now um, where you'll be able to go and like ask questions like that and a support team member or a community member will be able to help uh, answer specific questions you might have around those things. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you say that again? So the question is, uh, have you thought of not exposing Docker at all to the end user, providing a more higher level abstraction for end users to work with? That's a really good question. So the question was, have we thought of not exposing Docker to the end users? And um, that, that, kind of, we, that was a big consideration and something we've thought about, especially as we approach the problem of how to convert users who are on our checkbox infrastructure where you kind of paste the script in and bring them over into our, uh, our JET product. Um, not exposing Docker would certainly make that a lot easier. And we could probably switch out our LXC infrastructure with Docker in much the same way using a universal image. Um, and we've considered that, but I don't think, it doesn't really tie in with how we want a CI service to work. You know, it, it's not very personal it's not um, it's not native to your application, um, and we'd still end up with a lot of the same problems we had with LXC as well. So, how do you deal with uh, like Docker and when Docker releases a new version? So, do you all try to upgrade immediately or trail, or how do you do that? So, the question was, how do we handle Docker upgrades? What's the upgrade path for us around Docker? <laughs> Currently, we're on Docker 192, which is kind of old. And there's a very good reason behind this, because in Docker 110, they, um, they added um, content addressable images. And they removed the link between cached image layers. So when you pull down an image layer, or you pull down an image, the layers can no longer be used to cache unless, that ca or unless you built the image locally. So they broke caching for us, basically. And there's a very angry PR, or a very angry issue on the, the Docker code base where a lot of people from different places have complained. And a lot of our customers have also complained about it. So in 1.11, they added support for sharing that link between image layers via save load. The main concern was about man-in-the-middle attacks on image pools, like if somebody else sends down, or intercepts your Docker pull, they could, in theory, inject an image layer which masqueraded as a uh, part of your Docker file or step of your Docker file that was going to get built and become part of your container image, which um, does sound a little worrying, to be honest. So they're supporting. They've 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 uh, ended support for making that available via image pulls, but they're adding it into save load. So if you export an image to the file system you'll be able to uh, load that in on another machine and use the cache that's available. So um, our upgrade path, which is the original question, has been a little bit interrupted from this, um, but our intention is to stick as closely and as, as closely behind the uh, Docker updates as we can. Uh, we'd have to do a lot of load testing because they do add sort of performance bugs in every now and again, um, some regressions, uh, but usually upgrading early is a benefit because they fix other bugs, so we're always kind of chasing the tail. Uh, no. uh, it's, um, actually, it is a question. How, how do you guys distinguish yourself from Circles yet? Ah, okay. I, how, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer, actually. No, I just, like, do you want to do the sales pitch? <laughs> So 
So how do we distinguish ourselves from Circle CI? So I'm not actually too familiar with their product. In terms of Docker support, I think, I think Circle lets you interact with a Docker endpoint. But in terms of sort of native Docker described services and pipelines, it's, uh, I don't think it's, it's native. So um, you'd have to essentially have a set of Docker commands or use Docker Compose yourself to execute uh, complex uh, uh, applications on a Docker host. Uh, I think that's kind of where it comes in. Obviously, there's a lot more. You know, we're fantastic people. Not that they're not, but you know, we uh, we care deeply about our customers. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Um, for those who couldn't hear that, he was talking about the uh, the parity between development and test, and the fact that the local tool is a differentiator because it's harder to um, it's easier to rely on a commit fixing your tests when you have good parity locally and remotely. But we do lose the visibility because you can't SSH into your code chip build machine with Jet and play around with it. So the question was around whether the um, the support of Docker we have translates to Swarm and other Docker features like that, um, which is a, a great question. In fact, we're playing around with Karina, trying to see if we can use Karina um, for running builds. And since it's a standard Docker endpoint, albeit Swarm, it performs more or less the same way. So we can get the same kind of support. We have to do a few changes around how we do volumes because Mounting to the host is a little trickier on Karina, and that's always a concern. Um, but in general, you know, we, the this, this volume support, et cetera, works exactly the same way on Swarm. Um, we can rely on networks and shared volume providers across hosts the same way. So um, currently, it's, we kind of support single host on our build machines. But if you were to connect up a Swarm and run something against it, it, it should work more or less the same way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was, he was uh, trying to get a clearer explanation about how we encrypt credentials. Um, so right now, we when you sign up with CodeShip, you create your project, we provide an AES key. In fact, uh, let's see. CodeShip.aes. Uh, that is the project key. It's a bidirectional key. So um, if we were to create a, oh, yeah, that's all right. Uh, let, let's, let's encrypt our super secret deploy credential, our AWS API key, cough, cough. Um, and we'll run the encrypt command, which is part of the jet tool, which looks locally to find the uh, codechip.aes file, but you can override that. You can specify a different one. It helps if we spell things correctly. And we uh, put that into a encrypted file like this. It looks something like that. 
And that is something, if we go into our services file and we add that in to here, there's a you know, uh, Compose supports environment and an environment file. We support encrypted environment and encrypted environment file. So you'd add it into the services relevant. Um, is it, the, this is a deployment credential, so we'd want it in our service that was running the deployment. Um, if we run printemv with that in place, it'll print out the key. So um, we kind of uh, aggregate the environment together. Any unencrypted environment, any build environment variables like your commit IDs, timestamps, that kind of thing. Um, as well as any decrypted, encrypted environment variables all get put together in an environment. So you access it all through there. Any other questions? All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>